Hello, welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for many years. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Dustin Lance Black. Lance is an Oscar-winning filmmaker, writer and activist, perhaps best known for his screenplay Milk, which was made into a film starring Sean Penn. Lance is married to British Olympic diver Tom Daly, and they live in London with their young son, Robbie Ray. Thanks for coming along today. It's good to meet you. Yeah, of course. Good to meet you. Now, Very much. I know you've had some significant losses in your life. Sure. Are you okay to talk about that? Yes, please. Happy to. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think it's helpful to. God knows I've been doing plenty of it lately, yeah. <laughs> whether it's the book that I wrote that has, uh, you know, details some of those stories or then the tour on the other side, which has been quite surprising, where it's not just me sharing my stories of loss, but starting to hear so many coming in. But yes, ready to talk. Uh, I think it helps. Can we talk about your mum's death? Sure. How did she die? My mom, uh, well, I, you, you have to step back a little bit because my mom wasn't supposed to live very long from the age of two. Uh, she came down with polio uh, when she was two years old in Lake Providence, Louisiana. Um, and she uh, kind of lost the lottery really in every way. Not only did she get it, she got the most severe form. Um, she was uh, unable to move from the neck down. Uh, for some time, ended up uh, in a children's hospital uh, in Mississippi uh, where the doctors didn't think she would last long. She was in an iron lung. Um, and, you know, she showed the will to live uh, and and the, the good luck, I suppose, that the uh, virus stopped progressing. Um, she was able to regain the use of her arms and her hands, never anything below the chest, though, and really spent her life trying to prove the doctors wrong, the doctors who said she wouldn't survive, and if she did, she wouldn't have a life worth living. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand, I I met my mom as a woman in braces and crutches uh, with one quarter of one lung uh, working, uh, but still was alive and surviving and strong and gave the impression that Uh, she was perfectly fine all of the time, that she had the strength to use her arms as her legs. It's the persona that she put out at work and at home. And what we found out is that she was hiding a lot of pain and a lot of weakness. And I went home just uh, on my 40th birthday uh, just to be with her. I thought, well, you know, a lot of gay men think 40, boy, it's all over there. I thought, no, not not really. At that point, I had lost my big brother. Every candle in my cake was a celebration. Um, and I thought, who better to thank than my mom on my 40th? And she had what she thought was a bladder infection. She wasn't feeling well. Uh, we stayed up for two or three nights in a row uh, where she couldn't sleep. I was helping her to the restroom. She didn't seem well, um, but in her tough way was still hiding it, covering the pain, uh, really just enjoying Oreo cookies and watching NCIS and and Mm. shopping on the jewelry network with me. Mm. (laughs) And and I convinced her to go to the doctor. And my stepdad was on his way home uh, to take her to the doctor. I was headed to London to see Tom. Um, And I got the call in the cab about uh, 10 minutes after leaving the house uh, from my stepdad saying, turn around and come back. Um, Your mom lost consciousness in the car. Um, Her heart stopped. He was able to get her out of the car. My my stepdad had been a medic in the military um, and was able to give her CPR and to revive her. Uh, the, uh, 
the ambulances showed up very quickly and, and got her to the hospital. Our taxi cab is now racing towards the hospital. We see her ambulance up ahead of us. I'm frustrated that people aren't pulling over mm. for it and letting it by. I'm terror struck. I, I never, though, thought she might die. Uh, it was only the cab driver who, you know, thankfully had turned the cab around uh, gone over a grassy center median in the road to get us going back toward home, back toward the hospital. And he looked up in the rearview mirror and said, whatever will be now will be. And it was the first moment I ever considered that my mom was mortal. Mm-hmm. You know, with all that she had survived and suffered through, she had had cancer and she'd beaten it. She was uh, weakened uh, from fibromyalgia, from the treatments for cancer, but she still kept surviving, and there she was racing away from me in an ambulance. And I, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, I should back up two seconds and just say this. There was a moment uh, as I was helping her get dressed to go to the doctor before I left mm-hmm. for the airport, and um, she grabbed my arm at one point. Uh, as I was helping her put socks on her feet, as I'd done many times before in my life since I was six years old, and um, and she grabbed my arm and she looked me in the eyes and she said, fight for my life. It's not the sort of thing my mom would have said. My mom was so independent, she wouldn't have asked anyone to do anything like that for her. So it startled me. Um, and 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 she made me promise that I would, and I promised that I would, and as I left the room, the last thing I said to her was, was a joke. I just said, oh, it's been fun. Can't wait to do it all again in as campy a fashion as I possibly could just to try and get a joke, a laugh, anything out of her because the you know previous three nights had been exhausting and she wasn't feeling well and she was off to the doctor. And usually she would have responded in an equally camp fashion and, and she didn't. She just looked at me and gave me kind of a soft smile that I'll never forget. And so I arrive at the hospital with these orders to fight for my mother's life from her. And uh, I I rush in and my stepdad's already told the people in the emergency area, like, let me in. I I rush in um, and there she is and they're trying to intubate her. And she's suddenly conscious. Uh, Now I know she doesn't have her glasses on, so she can't see me well. So I just call out. I say, Mom, I'm here. And I see her eyes trying to find me. And uh, the doctor asks, can we sedate her so that we can intubate? And I know my mom's as claustrophobic as I am. I know the idea of intubation would just terrify her. And so I said, yes, yes. And I just watched them give her the injection. And I watched her relax. I was the last thing, the last person she saw in consciousness. And days passed. And the doctors kept wondering, is her heart going to hold out? They couldn't figure out which direction she was going. And so they decided to run a test. And when other people were giving up hope, I said, well, I have a mission. I've been told to fight for her life. So, yes, do the test. Do everything you can. And... um, We're just sitting in this waiting room, me and my little brother. um, My big brother is is dead at this point. um, And my stepfather and a a nurse comes in and she says, come with me. And there's an urgency in her voice. And I know that's probably not good. And we follow her into the room where they're doing this procedure to run a probe into her her heart to see uh, which way she's going. And I can already tell I walk in to the room and I can see that her vital signs are dropping. I know what that means. Um, And I believe someone in the room just said, talk to her. And uh, I just, I leaned in close to her ear and I just said the things that I think she needed to hear then. And I just said, we're going to be fine. You raised us strong. Uh, We can make it. So you can fly away now. You can move. You can dance. You can fly. So fly away, Mom. And at that moment, 
her heart stopped. And that was that. And I had absolutely lied to her. Because I said to her that we would be okay, and that was not true. Not yet. Um, and that began a, a long period for me that I was not okay, that I absolutely fa felt that I had failed in the mission to keep my mother alive, a mission that she set me on. And it would take me quite some time to start to figure that out and make sense of that. I just, I'm, I'm really struck by that there was no other option for you because there didn't sound like there'd been any other conversations. So that moment in the taxi when the driver, you know, looked into the mirror and, and said, what will be, will be. It feels like, and you describe it as that being the first moment to think, and well, actually, yeah. she might not get through this. Yeah. And she might die. And living might not be an option. Certainly, there, the conversation had not happened. And in fact, uh, you know, just months earlier, if not weeks earlier, doctors had done an exam of her and said, your mother's heart is strong. She's, you know, she does as we're suggesting she does with her health. She should have another good 10 years at least. And um, so, no, this came very much out of the blue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely out of the blue. Um, and... Um, I've always been my mother's caretaker. Well, since my father abandoned our family when I was six, I was my big brother was off doing very fun things and having a wild time of it, and I was left at home to help raise my mom as she's raising me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I never imagined. I only in the darkest of moments would imagine what life would be like without her. She was absolutely my foundation, and I was hers. Uh, and so it was a it was a, a foundational re relationship that w vanished within days unexpectedly, um, and you know if I'm being I should be completely honest in here. I mean I'm I'm assuming people are listening to this who have also experienced loss. Mm -hmm. I still haven't made complete sense out of it, and my life is not the same. And I think. You know, I don't know how helpful it is uh, when friends say, oh, it's going to be all right, and uh, or you'll get back to normal eventually. And, and I, I sometimes just want to say now, even from this perspective, fuck you. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. It is a loss. Uh, something foundational is gone. Uh, and that may never be the same. Mm -hmm. And and if you want it, your, your life to ever stand on similar ground again it's going to take some work and you're going to have to build and repair and um you know i i do i do prefer the friends who actually say something rather than just completely ignore mm. uh what's gone on i mean i you know for me in the past i guess six years now i've lost uh almost everyone who i knew and loved before that uh, except one brother who's still alive. I lost... Your younger brother. I, I still have my younger brother, but I lost my big brother, my mother, my mentor, uh, a best friend, uh, step-grandparents, most of my aunts and uncles. Um, it, it, for the most part, cancer swept through my family and took everyone I, I've known and loved. I'd like to go back, if it's okay, Lance, and just to those weeks after your mum died. What happened after... So I just, uh, the guy that I am, <laughs> took, took on all of the responsibilities of a funeral. Um, and how do we, you know, uh, how, do, how do I start to do this bit right? Like, I want to do things right. I want to do right by her. And so I kind of was, I was like a zombie. Uh, I was like the walking dead. And I was... Uh, sort of as if I was producing a play is the way I was producing uh, my mother's funeral. And we flew her body to California because we had buried uh, my big brother in California. The plan had been that everyone was going to head back to California. My mom was in, um, in Virginia when she died. And, and there was no plan. I mean, none of this had been discussed ever. So you were... None. You, know, you didn't have a guideline. Nothing. It just, I mean, fortunately, the spot next to my brother in this beautiful cemetery we had chosen was was available. Mm. 
And so I said, well, that's the place. And uh, my stepdad and, and my brother agreed. And, and so that, that was easy. I mean, they, they were in, in grief and, and really in shock. And so they were happy to let me lead the way in terms of the funeral. And, um, you know, and then getting as much of her family and friends and people to California as possible, mm. um, you know, and, and for my mom, that was a lot. My mom touched a lot of lives. So it was a lot of people. Um, and, and just and just planning. And I, 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 I got myself into the planning mode. But at one point, my mom had been uh, fairly religious, in fact, quite religious most of her life, Baptist and then Mormon. And then when she left the Mormon church, she maintained a faith that was detached from Mormonism, but it's still Christian. And, and so I was trying to figure out, well, who does this service? Um, how do I thread that needle? My mom didn't belie- belong uh, to an organized church anymore because of what went on with her and the Mormon church. which is a whole other story. And so I called up, just to ask advice, Bishop Gene Robinson, who had been the first openly gay man ordained as an Episcopal priest, a bishop. Um, so it, was a, it had been a big deal back in the day. And, and he'd been around uh, when we were doing the marriage equality fight. Mm-hmm. And I'd become friendly with him then. And his spirit was so calming and reassuring. And he was so wise. I thought, this is the man to ask. Well, long story short, when I asked him who I might have officiate my mother's funeral, mm. he suggested he do it himself. Mm. You know, I thought it was cool. I hope my mom <laughs> that we have um, someone um, like him do this. And he, he flew out. And I just remember, I remember him arriving and the house is filled with people. Some I know, some I don't know, some are family, some are friends. Uh, the house is filled with roses. My mom's name was Rosanna. Um, and and uh, people had sent roses for our, the, our rose. And uh, I was in the backyard, and the bishop was asking me just questions. And I finally, and in fact, he was smoking a cigarette, which <laughs> I, it, it, being coming from the Mormon faith, that just didn't happen. Uh, and so I was already like, wow, this is wild. There's a smoking <laughs> bishop in my backyard. Um, and... Uh, I, I just started to open up to him, and I told him what I hadn't told anyone yet, which was that my mother had uh, told me to fight for her life, mm. and that clearly, given what was going on, I had not done that particularly well. Um, and was questioning every turn um, that I had made and decision I had made. And, um I do remember him looking up to the sky, the dark night sky at this point, blowing a big thing of smoke out. And he looked down and he had a little tears brimming in his eyes. And, and, and he just had me start to talk about my mom. And everything I told him, he would giggle and he would laugh. And he would say, your mother knew, didn't she? You know, when, when, when you tried to make a joke saying you'd see her again soon, did she respond to you? Did she lie to you and say, I'll see you again soon, like she normally would? And I said, no, 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 she didn't. That was weird. And he says, well, she was saying something. When, in the months leading up to this, when she kept saying to you on the phone, oh, I'm a dinosaur now, Lance. Well, what do you think she was trying to say? What happened to the dinosaurs? You know, it's hard to say these things to your son. Maybe she was struggling to find a way to say it. So if she was trying to say that, which it seems very clear when you really step back and look at it, that that's Mm. what she was trying and failing to do, what did she mean, fight for my life? Why don't you ask yourself what she meant by that instead of assuming what she meant was that somehow you were supposed to keep her heart beating perpetually Mm. and forever, which she knows is impossible. And... uh, And so that began a journey I've been on to figure out what is it about her life and our life that is worthy of fighting for. And, you know, a a big part of my therapy has been like writing the book. What was it about us that was special 
what was it about us that was worth fighting for in these times? You know, and the thing that I've landed on time and again is my mother was a conservative Christian, mostly Republican her entire life, uh, a young woman from the South. And she gave birth to this liberal, progressive, blue, coastal Hollywood filmmaker who's gay. And guess what? My mom and I always figured out how to build a bridge between us, Hmm. how to build a bridge. My mom showed the courage and the curiosity always to reach out to me, to my friends, even though according to her faith, there was something wrong with them. She wanted to know if there actually was anything wrong with them. and, And her curiosity led her to a different conclusion than it did the Mormon church. She showed the courage and curiosity to do that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've, I've come to believe that fighting for my mother's life is, is, is fighting to let people know that uh, differences are a gift, not a curse. They're not something to be tolerated, but to be understood, accepted, and embraced. And that people in this, these days of deep division have to get to work, the hard work of building the bridges my mother was so good at building. That's worth fighting for. You know, when families are being divided um, in this world right now because some voted leave and some voted remain because some vote Republican and some vote Democrat and they're stopping, uh, they don't have the dinner conversations they once had. Uh, Their families are drifting apart, communities, states, countries drifting apart because we've decided our political differences are the highest plane of existence. Well, that's bull. And my mom knew it was bull. And I'm going to fight for her life, which represented a world in which there is a higher plane than politics and these petty divisions. That is what I'm fighting for now. Mm -hmm. Thanks to a smoking bishop in my backyard, I'm trying to find purpose in, uh, in those last words my mother shared with me. None of us know what's around the corner, but we believe planning and preparing now for end of life makes life better at the end. Marie Curie is here to help. For more information on how to have an open conversation around death and dying, visit mariecurie.org.uk forward slash talkabout and help make life better at the end. And then the funeral took place. The funeral, <clears throat> yeah, the funeral took place. I mean, the funeral was 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 kind of beautiful. I I talk about it. Um, I get into all the details in this this book that I've written. Um, uh, it was a wonderful mix of people from our very very different lives, uh, and and all the lives my mother had had touched. I mean, um, my mom went from being a conservative Mormon who had real problems with gay people and their inclusion in her military to what I called the queen of the queens. So a bunch of gay people showed up. Hmm. Uh, and, and honestly, oh, it breaks my heart because the, you know, I cried and our family, you know, shed tears and we were mourning. But, you know, the greatest tears were shed were from just some of my gay friends who felt my mother's warmth and acceptance. Um, uh, she was very good at listening. And so they were there. Uh, and then, you know, afterwards, I just had everyone back to the house. And my mother and I had always talked about how when she moved back to California, we were going to sit on the front patio of our house and drink mint juleps. And so I made a lot of mint juleps. And a lot of people drank them. And I may have had a few too many. Uh, and, you know, the good news is I was in this very new relationship at the time, um, with this young man who lived very far away in this How country. long had you and Tom been together when your mom died? I feel like it was only about a year or so. Okay. I mean, it was still, I mean, fairly new. Uh, yeah. It feels like ages and ages ago now. Um, but he had lost his father. Mm-hmm. And so we had already uh, really identified with each other's struggles. We'd both... Um, not only experienced incredible highs in our careers, him uh, winning world championships and, and Olympic medals and me with an Oscar, and then to have that uh, side by side with the death of a close family member, my brother, his father, we had already were very close in a way that 
you know, maybe people couldn't be if they hadn't experienced such things in their life. And here I'm about to lose my mother unexpectedly. And and it was just, it was also, it was in a moment of great loss, watching how he got on a plane, and that is not a short flight, uh, flew out to be in L.A. with me for that one day um, and uh, and had to fly right back uh, to practice. So, you know, I, he flew literally for 24 hours to be with me and, and at my side for maybe 8 to 10 hours. Um, and uh, it, it meant a lot. Mm. I think... I think a lot of people ask me ad- advice as they start to lose loved ones nowadays. I get and and these are friends and but also just strangers who have read Mama's Boy and kind of know, you know, what, what I've experienced and and I say never underestimate the tremendous power and it may be the most powerful thing a human being can do, which is to be there. I don't care what you say. In fact, Saying nothing can be quite powerful. Hmm. Be there. Uh, be there next to the person who is dying. Be there. If you can hold their hand, if that's fine by you and them, wonderful. If you can sing to them, terrific. Uh, if you can get them drunk on Crown Royal and play punk rock music like I did for my brother in the minutes he was dying, fan fucking tastic. Uh, but be there. And then when you're with people who are in grief and mourning uh, and you don't know what to say or to do, be there. Oh, the power of bringing someone a warm tea (laughs) Mm. when they're in grief. So many people describe how, you know, we'll have people talking about neighbours crossing the road because they don't know what to say. Mm. Or family members not making contact with people because they don't know what to say. Friends even as well. So these sort of separations happen at this time when, as you're describing, what's most important is that you're just there. You don't need to say anything. Sometimes practical things can help as well. You know, can you do some shopping? Can you go and get some milk and some bread? Oatmeal cookies. (laughs) (laughs) Put me on the sugar train uh, in in grief. Um, Lance, what's what's helped you? Um, uh, I don't know. I still wake up all of the time uh, wondering where my world has gone mm. and not recognizing the world around me. And I could not be more fortunate um, to have this new life in this new country with a wonderful husband and now a 14-month-old son. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm rebuilding. And, but I, I, I'd be lying if I said I don't... I often wake up and I don't recognize where I am. Um, and I, I think some of that, uh, w- you know, will continue to get sorted out. I, I, I think... Um, What's helped me in some ways is the reconnection with my mother's family. I challenged myself on the other side of my mom passing away. I, I said to myself, if uh, my mother had in her life shown the courage to come to L.A. and, and meet my gay friends and to see if she couldn't build a, a very unexpected bridge, mm-hmm. um, shouldn't I show courage to to go the other direction and to go back to Texarkana, to Texas, to Louisiana, and to reconnect with my family there. But could we connect? Is there a higher plane than politics? Are these relationships, these familial and community relationships worth fighting for? That was what my mother left me with. And so I did go back and I have reconnected with my family. Um, you know, I, I, and we don't agree on everything. You know, we're edging towards acceptance of each other. Um, and so, you know, that that gives me some strength. That helps. Yeah, there's something very powerful in that, I think, isn't there? That link, even if you're not getting along. But, you know, I mean, I, I, 
you, you talked about how neighbors and friends and coworkers will cross the street. And, and, you know, some literally do and others do it in other ways. Others you just don't hear from for a while. And it, it is it, – I don't want to make it seem like this is easy. And one of the things that's very much not easy about it is that it draws into question for you and probably everyone around you and who knew your loved one or knew what they meant to you, their own mortality. Hmm. And for some people, that's very scary. They don't want to get too close to death because then they have to admit to themselves that they're not immortal, that we're all dying. And so it forces us to face and accept something that's very difficult for many, if not most people, about this beautiful thing called life and existence, um, which is how ephemeral it is, hmm. how much we are all whispers. Um, and, uh, and that's hard. Um, I, I see that in, in, in many of the people who just kind of disappeared for a while. I had I have uh, not a lot of living family members left, but I have one aunt who I was always very close with, and my mother was very close with, and she couldn't come to the funeral. She could have, but she didn't. And um, it took me a while to understand and accept why this might have been difficult for her. And, and, um, and I think it had to do with some of that acceptance of our own mortality. Hmm. How often do you think about your own death? I'm a writer constantly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. I um, I, you know, I, I don't like the idea. Uh, you know, I I resist it probably more than most. I I'm a, I'm my mother's child. I'm very curious. I can't believe that I'm not going to know what the world's going to look like in the year three thousand. That drives me mad. Um, I want to know. Um, I want to witness, I want to observe, I want to see. I, I know where there's still the very beginning of this thing called existence and understanding what it means. And, and of course, I'm only going to be here for a brief bit of that. Hmm. I will say, and it's taking me a little while to get my head around this, but I had a therapist who said to me, as I expressed some of my fear of dying and and how having lost so many people so quickly made this feel very real. It also made me feel like, I mean, it was literally every few months someone incredibly close to me was gone. It was funeral after funeral after funeral. Uh, I had not experienced that since I was a teenager in San Francisco and watching my mentors die of AIDS and funeral, funeral, funeral. This felt like another instance of that and, 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 um, uh, and so you know, I kept thinking maybe I'm next, maybe I'm next what's right around the corner for me. And this therapist said to me, you know, a fear of dying is, is really a fear of living. And I thought on that for a little while, and I thought, well, it's absolutely true. You know, living, part of living is dying. Uh, you can't have one without the other. That's the way it works. And so... If I am incredibly worried about this dying thing, it's going to limit my ability to live. If I truly love being alive, if I love existing, if I am curious about everything going on around me, well, I should be curious about the dying bit. Mm -hmm. I should, I, I must accept that that's a part of it. It's madness not to. Um, and, uh, and so... As much as I want to delay it as long as possible, particularly now that I'm a dad, um, I, I do feel like one of the things I've done is to try and, you know, turn up the volume on my living and, as, as a part of accepting dying. Is it something you and Tom talk about? Well, of course, because we've both lost uh, uh, people incredibly close to us. Do you um, talk about your own deaths and the future? Well, you, you know, you have to... We we have a little bit. Uh, we had a little bit, um, but it really comes up when you have a son hmm. or a daughter, I, a family, uh, and I am um, at that point. Your responsibilities uh, go beyond your own life, <laughs> and so you have to start thinking about things like wills and and uh, how do you go about leaving things to your children, uh, to your spouse? How do you make sure people are going to be all right uh, uh, when you're gone? 
Um, and so you start planning for your own death. So you've been doing some of those practical things Absolutely. since you became a father. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, becomes, it becomes very different because now it's, I am a warrior for my son. I want to uh, make sure he has every opportunity possible um, at his fingertips. I want, I want to instill in him the values my mother instilled in me. Um, and I want to make sure that if something happens to me, because you never know uh, what's going to happen day to day, that he's going to be okay with the practical things. He's going to be okay. Um, and so... Um, Yes. I think it would be irresponsible not to have done a will. Did you have conversations about funeral wishes? Uh, we haven't. Okay. Frankly, <laughs> that's the thing I care the least about. Uh, because of all the productions that I'll ever be involved with in my entire life, I won't be there for that one. I don't quite care what the critics think of that play. Because <laughs> I, I don't think... I, I won't be around, and if, if by some miracle I am still able to witness things uh, in the afterlife, I probably am going to realize how little any of it actually matters. Mm. <laughs> and um, uh, so, no, I, I think, you know, in a way, funerals are for the living, not for the one who's passed away. And, uh, and I think that's important. And I think, you know, I've, I've done a few now, attended many now, um, and the best ones seem to be places where um, people can grieve slash eat. <laughs> Eating is important. Can be with each other in a safe space. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I say to many of my Jewish friends that I think they have it right. A lot of food for a significant period of time surrounded by people you love. And you really do the hard work of grieving. Mm. You focus on it. Be with it. Uh, that to me feels healthy, um, and and to really give yourself the space and time to be able to grieve, to shed the tears. Uh, hearing my mom, uh, you know, my mom's voice in my ear, because I grew up in a tough. I grew up southern and Texan, and in the military, and you know, men don't cry. Well, my mom, uh, thankfully, said to me at one point. Uh, you know, tears are just a sign that you're you're healing. That's what they are. Don't let anyone tell it you it's weakness. That's a, just not true. It's a sign that something inside of you is healing. So when you start to cry, cry. Heal. So giving yourself space and time uh, to do that, um, uh, I think is important. So, you know, I, I if I drop dead on the way out of this studio, I hope that... Uh, Tom and 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 uh, and my little brother plan something with a lot of space and time for people to cry and to drink and to eat a whole lot. I want <laughs> no one paying attention to their diet. <laughs> I am. Um... But what you do with this fleshy thing? Well, what does that matter to me? Mm. It's not who I am. Mm. In our work, I think that kind of some of the conversations about writing a will and doing some of those practical things can be incredibly helpful for those left behind. And also, like funeral planning, so often people die, they've not had conversations about their funeral wishes, mm -hmm. and then there's conflict in the family or conflict in those left behind who are trying to make those plans. And that can be difficult so I suppose for us we would we would we would always have those conversations with people who were dying mm -hmm. and also people who were um, you know carers loved ones significant others is it important you know is it important to you as you're saying it's not yeah it's not particularly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I do hope uh, you know I think that's very very good advice I, I, I'm in a in a fortunate position that you know, when I think about my little brother and my stepdad um, and Tom, uh, they get along incredibly well. They're very close. So I think they would, it wouldn't become a, a squabble in our family. Is your legacy important to you? Well, I think what I do with my life uh, is important to me. Um, I, I do 
for whatever reasons, live with a bit of a mission and a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certainly not meandering through this thing. Uh, so my legacy is only important to me insofar as it means that I've lived a life of purpose and meaning and somehow maybe pushed the needle a bit uh, towards a more, you know, the more equal treatment of people of difference, which is all of us. Um, that's it. Uh, I don't. Uh, I live a life because I uh, dedicated to making sure people like my mother, who is disabled and you know uh, isn't treated differently under the law and by society because of her difference. Uh, as a gay person, same goes. Um, you know, and 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 I think because I've experienced those two things, I I also believe other people who are different in their own ways ought to be treated equally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whether it's the God they pray to or the color of their skin or their gender. I mean, these are things that are very important to me. And and, and I do hope that I uh, am successful enough in my work that there is a legacy for a nanosecond in the history of time. Uh, you know, I mean, none of these things last. I mean, let's be real. I, 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 uh, if, if you're living life for how you're written about in history books after your death, well, you're I'm also a historian in what I do, and I know you're screwed. Mm -hmm. It's really not up to you. Your legacy isn't up to you. It's up to, uh, you know, luck. Do the, the, the books about you and the things about you get made and who's making them? And, and truly, I mean, these people who have, we say have survived so long in history, whether that be, you know, religious figures or my heroes, Shakespeare or Charles Dickens who lived right here in this neighborhood. Well, let me just tell you, the person we think we know who has survived in history, well, that's not the person that really existed. That's an interpretation by historians and authors. And, you know, they become more and more make-believe and majestic all of the time. It's a, it's a silly thing to live for, I think. Just for our listeners, is there anything you might advise people who are grieving or bereaved or are caring for somebody now who's dying? I mean, I think I've probably said some of it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there's any one piece of advice because every loss, I'm just thinking through mine, every loss is so different. Yeah. There's a different story. It's a different relationship. So I'm not sure I want to give any singular uh piece of advice to the person who's grieving. Um, you know, sometimes they have to go through anger. I don't want to tell them that that's wrong. Sometimes they might need to not go to work for a while. I don't want to tell them that's wrong. For some people, that might not be wrong. That might work for them. Uh, I, I, I just, I really think, um, you know, do take care of yourself. I'm going to give really basic advice eat, hydrate. I would say if you can take a break from drinking, that helps in this time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's just be, this, I'm not, you know, a sober person and I'm not preaching that, but it is a depressant mm -hmm. and you're likely going to be depressed. So let's not exacerbate that with alcohol. Might not be the thing to do. Mm -hmm. It is helpful for many to be around loved ones. But own your space, own this time, own your grief. And if there's someone you it, that it's not that who is not helpful to be around, in my opinion, see if you cannot be around them. <laughs> um, uh, other than that, the real advice, and I've already said it, is for the people who are um, the loved ones of the person grieving, and and it's it's just the thing that. Uh, I say time and again, which is be there for them. Mm. And that's and there are a, a multitude of ways you can do that. And if you make an, a killer banana bread, that's a fantastic way of being there. <laughs> that's, uh, but there are many ways. Use your talents to figure out how to be there. Uh, you don't need to figure out how to help them make it okay. That's not your job. It's not okay. It's hard. This person will be missed. This is probably something in their life that is going to need repair now. Uh, and then avoiding talking about it is also probably not helpful. There will come a time where this person is likely going to want to express their grief and to talk about it. And guess what? Listen. Mm. You don't have to fix it. There is power in listening. So in that way, I think there's probably more clear-cut advice. 
Lance, thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you. It's been great to meet you and hearing your stories. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. And thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. in, in your way, by doing this, you're being there. So thank you. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. Join us next time when we'll be talking to actress Alison Steadman. This podcast is made by Marie Curie, a national charity that supports people affected by terminal illness. For more information and support, you can visit our website, mariecurie.org.uk. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceani. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.